<clears throat> first three phases, just to point out, have kind of like a death archetype part of it. So there's a loss involved with all three. Things are slowly starting to die out, okay? And stage four, normalization, nobody. It's kind of like you wipe the slate clean. All the stuff from before is offline, and you're kind of in that limbo, in, in, in the middle. Um, I like to think of it as like the waiting at the airport feeling. You know, you picture yourself, you go to an airport, you <clears throat> your luggage, you're just walking around, waiting for your flight. You're not really home. You're not really at your destination. You're someplace in that middle ground, okay? So that's sort of the next phase. So the old stuff kind of died out. We're kind of in the middle, and we're not really sure what's coming next yet. And this is a very challenging phase, okay? This has to do a lot with the part that talks about dark night and chaos, right? So if we think about dark, if you were in a room in, in pitch black darkness, you know, and you weren't familiar with the room, you wouldn't know where you're going. You don't know what you could trip over and where the dangers are or where there's safety or where there's a place to sit. You know, you, you really don't know what's going on, right? And there's also a sense of chaos, right? So chaos implies kind of like a disorganization that, you know, we're not really sure how things are going. There's a lot of uncertainty. And that could be very disturbing. Like, so to our brains, which are geared for survival, we interpret uncertainty as something that's dangerous a lot of the time, right? Because if you don't know what's coming, it could be something that's threatening to you. And so we could easily <coughs> uncertainty as a threat. And then we could react by going backwards and trying to put back old systems that probably were meant to die out anyway. And so we could regress at this point. We could devolve at this point if we're not careful, right? But we're able to relate to the uncertainty with more empowerment and more patience and, you know, more mindfulness and just stay with it and trust the big plan that things are going to have a way of moving. Then we can navigate that stage much more effectively. All right. So that's a big challenge. Stage four. Stage five, gestation. Right, so I have a picture of an unborn baby there. So that's essentially gestation. So gestation is the period between conception and birth, right? So this is the period where new ideas about how things are gonna move forward start coming online. So for COVID-19, we're starting to hear certain ideas about how we're gonna open up the country in a different way, in a safer way. Um, they haven't fully come into play yet, but there's talk about it. There's some vision going on, right? So that's gestation. Um, but gestation isn't a guarantee either, because just like a fetus, you could also abort the new ideas and still go backwards, right? The, the new ideas are still incubating. They're still working themselves through. And, you know, they still need more nurturance in order to be born, okay? So finally, stage six, reorganization and rebirth. So that's when the ideas start coming into manifestation. They actually get to be put into practice. They say it's like the noon point of a dark night cycle. So you went through the dark night, the sun came up in gestation, and now it's fully emerging into noon. So it's kind of how the new normal is gonna be set up. And we still don't know what that's gonna be. Right? There's still a lot of uncertainty about that. But if we navigate the cycle properly and well, it could be a, a brand new start for us and something really positive, okay? Personally and collectively. All right, so, um, so one of the things we want to talk about is, well, if we're navigating through the dark night cycle, what are we navigating from and to? All right, so this is the first example in a very kind of a simple way. So being versus doing. Um, or actually, I really wanted to say doing versus being, but I couldn't find a picture that had the words reversed. So anyway, um, so prior to COVID-19, when we had our quote unquote normal life going, we had a lot of things to do. You know, we were working, well, more people were working for sure. We were busy doing our usual activities, our recreational activities, our social activities. And there's a kind of a, a cultural mandate to keep busy you know, that your worth is based on the stuff that you do and that the things that you surround yourself with and do and the people you're around 
kind of help to define who you are. And when we had to put these aside for COVID-19 because of stay at home orders and so forth, we kind of have to face ourselves without all the stuff. And we have to figure out who am I without my job? Or who am I not going to school? Or who am I not keeping busy all the time? And that could be a kind of a scary thing. Um, some people are terrified of having nothing to do and being bored. It's actually a huge trigger for relapse in uh, the addiction world, you know. Um, but if you're willing to use being in an effective way, it could really be a great time of self-reflection. Um, I was listening to a speaker talk about COVID-19. He said, this is actually kind of like the biggest meditation retreat. Nobody decided, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, you know, we all just kind of involuntarily were, were told to, you know, just be with ourselves, okay? But if we do the kind of self-reflection that's necessary, we can get a lot, of, a lot from it, you know? Now that we have less to do, we could think, well, when I put things back in my life, do I really want to do it the same way? Um, are there habits and patterns that weren't working for me that maybe I should change more deliberately now instead of just going back to an old habit? Um, do I really want to do the same thing for a living that I was doing before I was laid off? You know, or now that I'm sitting with myself, I'm stuck with a lot of resentments. Are those things I need to start letting go? Maybe I need to do more forgiveness. You know, there's a lot that can really come from giving ourselves more space to be. And if we like it enough, we might choose to do it even more afterwards. So when we reintegrate stuff into our life, maybe some of the habitual busyness isn't working for us the way we want it to. Maybe we don't want to be on our electronics as often. Maybe we want more quality time with people in person because we know how much that means, right? So a lot of opportunities in the being versus doing, okay? Oh, whoops, okay. So another big thing that I had to insert in here has to do with fear. And some people almost call it that the secondary virus is the fear virus. You know, we have the physical, biological virus, but there's a lot of toxic fear that's going around, right? And some of it comes from the media and the scary stories we hear about how dangerous it is and how many people are dying and, you know, all the stuff that's going on. And all you got to do is watch the news for a few hours and you could freak yourself out very easily, right? And people create fear within among themselves. My mother told me a story about, you know, one of her friends already was a germaphobe and now she's really a germaphobe, you know, and she's Lysoling all the boxes from the grocery stores before she puts them in the closet. And, you know, my mom starts thinking then, oh my God, maybe I should do that. And I don't know, am I, am I doing enough, right? So other people's fear starts becoming your fear, right? And the toxicity is when it becomes excessive and it's about things you can't control anyway or it's influenced by fear experiences you had in the past that are now amplifying what you're experiencing right now. So if you already were struggling with fear in different areas of your life before coronavirus, it might be intensified during the coronavirus, okay? So it might force you to have to look at your issues with fear and try to approach them in a different way, okay? So the thing you can migrate to is what I'll call adaptive fear or preparedness, okay? So we have fear for a reason, right? It's a survival mechanism. If you're in the woods and a bear comes along and you're afraid, that's a reasonable thing to feel, right? When there's actual danger, fear could help mobilize you to do something that will help you survive, okay? But when it's excessive, it's when it gets in the way, okay? So we have to understand, like, what do we need to prepare? How does the fear that we feel help us to take productive actions that'll actually help us rather than immobilize us and keep us stuck, right? So if you are afraid of getting sick, it's, it's a good, I, it, it makes sense. And if your fear mobilizes you to do social distancing and wash your hands and wear PPE, then you're being prepared, right? If you go overboard, it could be a little bit too much, okay? And one of the quotes that I heard recently, which I liked a lot, is chance favors the prepared mind. So, of course, we're all taking a chance, and we're, we don't know for sure if we're going to get sick or not, but if we're prepared, we have a better chance, right? So that's one of the um, things to keep in mind. And talking about the evolution, okay, and the dark night chaos cycle, it's also natural to feel fear when you're moving forward, when things are changing, right? 
So when we're in that uncertainty phase, it's a sign, the fear is a sign that, that I'm expanding, that things are migrating to something else. And that's not always a bad thing. It kind of makes sense in that situation. So you don't have to react to that fear with additional fear or to feel that it's wrong, okay? Actually, best way to deal with fear or any intense feeling is with self-compassion and allowing it to be there, listening to its message and working with it, not just trying to cut it out, okay? Integrating it as part of who you are and what your experience is and part of what your process is right now, okay? So relating to it in that way kind of helps the fear to move forward rather than get stuck. Okay, so here's a big one, okay? Powerlessness, false power, and power. All right, so one of the biggest things related to fear um, that COVID-19 brings out for us is a sense of powerlessness, right? So when we feel powerless, we feel like we don't have the capacity or ability to control or influence something. And there's certain things in COVID-19 that are totally out of our control. Um, we can't fully control the course of the virus, who's gonna live or die, um, whether you're gonna lose your job or not, what your life is gonna be like after the virus. There's some decisions we can make that help, but we don't have full control in any sense. And the powerlessness is very upsetting to us. It makes us feel like we're threatened. And it's normal to react to powerlessness with what I'll call false power, okay? And when I give some examples, you'll probably recognize some of these things. Okay, um, just gonna check my list just to make sure I got everything. So, so one way is to go so deep into the powerlessness that you take on a victim identity. So you get into the why me, and why did this have to happen, and what's fair and what's not fair. And you're so entrenched in your victimhood that you wear it as a badge. And you might get some attention for it, which gives you a false sense of power, but it's just gonna keep you stuck. And it's gonna get people to resent you as well. So not always the best choice, but it happens. Um, shaming and blaming, right? Like I said earlier, in stage one of the constellation, there really is multiple causes that led to COVID-19 or to anything, really. But when we try to narrow it down and blame a person or a group or a country, it makes us feel like we have some sense of control. Like if I know what the cause is, then maybe I know how to deal with that cause. And then I won't feel as powerless anymore, or I could prevent this in the future. But it's not based on a truth. It's based on an emotion or a lie. And so the blaming and even trying to change yourself by shaming yourself. Well, I got sick because I did this, because I did that. It just, it, it doesn't really move us forward. It's based on our emotions. It's based on our defenses, our wounds, okay? For some people, um, addict patterns come online. Um, in a more benign sense, you might find yourself, you know, compulsively eating, compulsively online shopping, um, compulsively buying toilet paper, um, other people, their drug and alcohol use might come back if it was if they were in recovery. Um, because addiction is designed to take us out of the moment. It's designed to take us away from uncomfortable feelings, such as powerlessness and fear. And at a time like this, when it's really intense, you might go back to old patterns to cope, such as addiction. Um, so very important to address that as much as you can, especially when there's more social isolation and it's even harder to deal with that but that's definitely a shadow pattern. It's a sense of false power. You might temporarily feel better, but it's really not working. Um, also having a sense of tribalism. So that means like if you cluster with a group of people of a certain mindset and they might give you a sense of power. So if you're one of the protesters saying, I want my freedom back, you know, don't tread on me and all that kind of stuff, you know, the group makes you feel empowered, but it's a powerless, a, a power pattern based on individuality, based on division, and not based on the bigger picture. So it, that's why I call it a false power. Okay, but on a more po uh, positive note, okay, so power. Um, so power comes from a deeper place. 
So whereas false power is more of an ego defensive thing, power comes more from your inner core, your inner spirit, um, your values, and your higher self. So power is things that help to move the situation forward and follows rules such as collectivism, holism, interconnectedness, and things like that, which we're going to talk about a little bit more later. Okay, so approaching a situation with acceptance, with strength, um, going straight to the truth of the situation instead of running to of some false li lies that are spread in the news. Okay, um, understanding that we're all in this together is more of a powerful position than I just want my freedom. Okay, trusting in the big plan, being willing to do what it takes. Okay. And when you understand what is actually within your power and knowing where your powerlessness and where you do have power, that in itself gives you power. And once you understand that, you could take the first step. You could take an action that makes you feel more powerful. And one guy suggested we should make a power list and every day try to do one thing on that list. And that'll kind of boost our sense of inner power, okay? There was a book I read once called Power Versus Force. And it's a very similar idea. Um, and when I work with some of the guys at work, they have issues with aggression, right? So using aggression is a force. You know, using patience is a power. Um, forcing your opinion on someone is a force. Gently persuading is a power, right? So th there's a difference of, of degree. Okay. All right. So next, okay. Lies versus truth. Okay. Um, another kind of psychic virus is lies. And this has been one of the constellation phase things. So for a number of years, there's been more and more lies in the news, the media, social media, and we're almost accustomed to it. We're expecting people to lie to us. You know, we're expecting that the news is gonna be probably dishonest, um, that we should take everything with a grain of salt, that we don't really know where the truth lies. And the thing is, COVID-19 is the ultimate truth teller. You know, people could, are still trying to lie, but COVID-19 is going to tell the truth, right? So they could say, yeah, we have enough PPE. And then the nurses on the front line are going to say, no, we don't. <laughs> you know, or you could say, well, we're ready to open up the country. And if we're ready, that's great. But if we're not, COVID-19 is going to tell us the truth. So it's kind of forcing us to look at our relationship between lies and the truth. Um, one of the terms that I, I read about one time that I liked a lot was that sometimes we invite people to lie to us because we have a hard time handling the truth. Kind of like Jack Nichols said, you can't, you can't handle the truth, right? All right, that's my impression. So, you know, if we have a hard time accepting the truth or metabolizing the truth, we might invite people to lie to us, or we might invite ourselves to buy into a lie that sounds simpler than the more complicated and uncertain truth. So the more we're comfortable with uncertainty, the more we're willing to let the truth in, the better off we are. Because when we make decisions based on the truth, we're always gonna be in a more powerful place than when we make decisions based on part truths or false information, okay? So this is something in addition to COVID-19, you know, we could look at in our lives as a whole, in our relationships. Where am I inviting lies? Where am I not telling the truth? And um, how could I be better at aligning myself with the truth? All right, whoops, sorry. Um, next one, really important, division versus holism. Okay, so just like there's been more and more lies societally, there's also been more and more division. And we could see it, you know, political parties are very divided, there's been more encouragement for races to be divided. You know, men and women, Republicans and Democrats, US versus foreign countries, the border wall, Brexit. There's a lot of division going on. Um, even within ourselves, as a psychologist, I'll say, one of the biggest problems people have is when there's inner division and a war within yourself. And when there's a war within yourself, it tends to also become interpersonal. So if you hate the part of yourself that's fearful, or you hate the part of yourself that's powerless, and you try to shut it out by engaging in addictive behaviors or doing other kinds of impulsive things, you're gonna have more and more problems. So what's going on on the inner also goes on between people as well. 
and societally, right? And one of the greatest causes of suffering, as they talk about in Buddhism especially, is when you feel like you're isolated and disconnected from the whole, right? One of the great spiritual truths is that all is one and that there's holism, that we're all interconnected. And when we fully internalize that truth, we're in a much more powerful place. So one of the big messages, as I've mentioned before, that you've all heard a million times on TV at this point, is we're all in this together, right? So that's promoting holism. And ultimately, we're going to be much better off fighting the virus if we all work together, if everyone plays the role that they're able to play, whether it's staying at home or it's working on the front line. Working together and doing what we got to do is what's going to fix the virus. The more divided we are, the more we quibble about policies and politics and who's right and who's wrong, the worse off we're going to be, right? So it's a huge lesson in division versus holism for COVID-19. But it's also a lesson we could take into other parts of our life, even in terms of the way we talk, because our words have a lot of power. When you open your mouth to say something, is it creating more division or is it creating more unity? Am I putting out a judgment that's just going to piss people off and create more tension and anger? Or am I saying something that's going to unite us a little bit better? Right? We could really look at ourselves and how we're responding to that. Okay. All right. So next one kind of related to that. Okay. Self-centeredness and self-care. And also, on the other hand, compassion, fatigue, and service. Right? So... The ones on the left, as you can see, are, are more of the false power pattern, whereas the ones on the right are more of the true power pattern, okay? So you see all of this going on right now. Self-centeredness, people who just want their freedom, that want their you know, rights to do whatever they want, and don't really care how it's affecting other people. So again, the division is playing a role in here too. So when you're only thinking about you and what you want, that's the self-centeredness. And that's actually going to promote more problems with the virus, right? On the other hand, talking about the self, self-care, though, is super important. It might have been something we were neglecting already, even before COVID-19, right? So we might not have been caring for our needs that well. We might have been so stressed out with all the doing we were doing that we weren't turning inward and thinking, well, what's the best thing? for me to make sure I'm okay? Am I eating okay? Am I taking care of my health? Am I exercising? Am I socializing enough? Am I having enough downtime, right? All that self-care stuff that was optional before is super important now, especially since it ties into our immune system functioning. So self-care is being brought out as one of the things we really need to work on. And at my hospital, um, we're working right now to try to promote more of that with the staff because staff are also getting very burned out especially the line staff that are working double shifts. So self-care, always good to do. And when, as I say, you know, um, when you take care of yourself, you're more able to be in a better position to help other people, okay? So compassion fatigue. So that's the point where you help out people so much and you put so much of yourself into them and their, their pain becomes your pain and you, you neglect yourself in the act of helping others. And people want to help, you know, and it makes you feel less power, powerless when you're able to help. And it's a great thing to be of service to other people. But there needs to be a balance between self-care and compassion toward other people. So compassion fatigue, also something we have to watch out for at times like this, especially frontline staff. Um, or even parents, you know, at home with little kids, you know, I mean, you're with them all day, you're being their teacher and their parent. It's, it's a lot, right? Um, service in a more empowered way. So that's when you're not just um, doing for somebody. You're helping to lift somebody up. You're offering to them. You're doing those little things that make a difference. And we see people doing it all over the place. And there's a lot of inspiring stories that they keep coming out with on the news, which is great. You know, people who are bringing food to neighbors, who are knitting little hearts for and notes for um, frontline workers, people who are putting out signs in support of people. So all those are little ways for service. It doesn't even have to be something big, but it's important to have compassion and serve others because it takes you out of yourself for a little while and it brings you back into the whole. So if you're feeling isolated in your own pain or your own worries about this thing, a great way to reconnect to the power grid, so to speak, is by 
serving other people. Okay, and there's always something we could do. Okay, so finally, um, well, almost finally anyway. Um, so we, I presented you guys with a lot of choices that we have, a lot of patterns where it's more of a shadow pattern versus a power pattern. And if we just go by our habits, we might easily slip into negative patterns and the old ways of doing things that may have been okay, but may not have fully served us that well. So it's important for us to make a conscious choice about what's really best for us and to use COVID-19 and the challenges it presents to us as opportunities to make these better choices and then take those choices post COVID-19 to rise ourselves and evolve to a higher level. Okay, um, to make sure I said everything I wanted to say about that one. Um, another term that they talk about a lot too is co-creation. And when we co-create, we are choosing to together each make the choice in the right direction. And there's almost like a tipping point they talk about where if enough of us make those power choices, it starts to make a societal shift and all of us can start to move in the right direction. So that's a really powerful thing about the choice and that each one of us could affect our individual life, but when you get better, you, you affect other people's lives in a positive way too. It's like a tuning fork. When you have a higher vibration, the other people vibrate in a higher vibration too. So everything you do becomes a model for other people and it could really help serve everybody, okay? Um, so I hope you'll all choose to uh, accept this invitation to evolve and move forward. And um, that pretty much concludes the lecture portion of my presentation. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to entertain questions. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, if anybody wants to, you can definitely unmute yourself. Um, I, uh, I took a lot of things away from this. It was very nice. Um, I will say that um, the, um, I like the lies versus truth slide. I thought that that was pretty good. And the fact that um, COVID-19 is really the, only, the major truth, like it's gonna tell us what, what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, it helped you realize that, so. Um, and the thought crossed my mind too, uh, as you were ending, um, what is going to happen after all this is said and done? Do we go back to who we once were? Do we take that to the higher level that you're talking about? So that, that's interesting too, to think about, you know, how, how we are going to overcome all this and mm -hmm. what we're going to be like when we come out of it. So mm -hmm. it's very good. Thank you. Um, the gestation and the rebirth phase are all co-created, you know, again, so it's partly about the choices we're making and how that's going to turn out. So I hope it, hope it works out for everybody. We could be um, realistically optimistic. <laughs> yes. I just love the way that you put everything in perspective <laughs> and everything came full circle. So thank you very much, Jen, because it really helped to, um, to, to just make a little bit of sense of the whole progression of what's been going on. So thank you. All right. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs>